if you look up R&B songs with the keyword of heaven, do you know how many, how many songs pop up? People, people love to sing about heaven. People love to talk about heaven. But everybody talking about heaven. Y'all don't know the rest of that saying? Everybody talking about heaven, they go, listen, heaven, heaven, heaven. Somebody say heaven. heaven. On last, the last time I stood before you, I had the opportunity to talk about what heaven looks like according to the Bible. This is a Bible study, so everything we discuss is going to be biblically based. I will say this from the outset. Everything that I am teaching you, I am teaching you to the best of my understanding of it. Um, these are spiritual matters. And because these are spiritual matters, some of these things we will not have concrete answers to until we stand before the Lord. So, but according to the Scripture, I will give you the best uh, description of these things that I possibly can. So, what, so last, last time we talked about what heaven will look like now we're going to talk about what existing in heaven will be like. What existing in heaven will be like. Okay, all right. Um, let's start here. I want to I want to lift this question. And I had a phone call come to me and uh, a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, and it was a it was a very very good question. We had some good conversation on it. So I, I actually want to start there in our conversation about what. The, what our existence in heaven will look like. But in order for us to work our way there, I need you to tell me what some of your favorite funeral time songs are. Anybody want to? A fa favorite? Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, Save the Wretch Like Me. Who else? Yes, ma'am. I'll Fly Away. Yeah, I'll, I'll Fly Away. Some Glad Morning, When This Life Is Over. I'll fly away. Uh, going up or yonder. It's good to have you back. Uh, what, what was that, Sister Wolf? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see, G I, I don't know if we all going to make it, though, but when we all get there, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Yes, sir, last one. Oh, hold on. Well, I didn't, you, you didn't, then you, Brother Folsom. Yes, sir. Sir? When the gates of heaven swing open. Where you from again? <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know that one. Yeah. It, when the gates of heaven swing open. Anybody? A few of you. Okay. Otis Clay? Okay. All right. Uh, oh. All right. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Precious Lord, take my hand. Listen, I'm telling y'all this right now. When y'all have my funeral, I only want one slow song permissible. This is the song. I've told you this before. It is, I shall wear a crown. I, now, I was told recently, Bishop, that uh, there, is a, there is a ceremony that, that is done at some that is done at some uh, funerals. I did not know this until I was getting ready for the funeral we had last week, that, uh, that they, they'll sing that song, I shall wear a crown. I don't know if you know the words or not, but it's I shall wear a crown when it's all over. Uh, I'm going to put on my robe, tell a story how I made it over. Now, if y'all do another one other than that, that's on y'all. But I'm just letting you know what, what, my, what my request is. Uh, let's explore some eschatological theology here. Let's explore a little eschatological theology because I'm wondering if the songs we love about funerals in heaven are theologically sound. Let's, first of all, look at, look at mine now. When, when I say eschatological, uh, let me break it down for you because we're in Bible study. I, I, I want to, let, let's do a little biblical education here. Uh, eschatology is derived from the Greek word eschatos, which means last or final. 
Eschatology is the branch of theology that deals with the study of the last things and the end of time to include heaven and hell. All right? Eschatology. Somebody say eschatology. eschatology. Let me spell it for you. E S and uh, in the chat, I want y'all to I want y'all to spell this out. Type it in, then hit enter. All right, here, here it is. This, this is eschatology. E S C H A T O L O G Y. Now, let's look at my song and what it sings in terms of the existence that we'll have in heaven. This is what this is what this song, the the, the theology of it says. That one. When I get to heaven, I have a crown. Also, I have a robe. I'm going to put on my robe. I, I shall wear a crown. I'm going to put on my robe. Uh, I'm going to, so I'm going, I, I, I feel like it's also some implied benches or chairs some type of sitting that's going to be that is going to be uh, a part of a part of this also uh here's another part that I will be telling my story I don't know who I'm going to tell my story to but I'm going to tell it to somebody I don't know who get to go first I don't know if you going first or I'm going first or we just going to talk over each other go we so happy that that we made it in but this is some of the theology that that we have at least from one of my favorite songs we are trying to understand, and I continue to tell you this as we delve into this, we are trying to understand supernatural matters with our natural mind. This is a very difficult thing to do. We are trying to, heaven is supernatural. It is not of this earth. It is supernatural. Therefore, everything about heaven is supernatural. And also, everything about our existence in heaven is supernatural. So what, so what we do in order to understand is we do something called anthropomorphizing. Anthropomorphizing. Y'all, y'all don't, y'all forget I've gone to school for this stuff. Anthropomorphizing. Let me break that word for you down too. See, you already got two new terms. One was eschatology and now anthropomorphizing. Now, let me explain it this way. Y'all ever seen Mickey Mouse? Do mice talk? Do mice wear clothes? Or in his, or in his case, shorts and shoes? Yeah, big old shoes. What that is called is anthropomorphizing. We take something that has no human characteristics and give it human characteristics. We allow it to talk, to dance, to reason, to have relationships and all that other kind of stuff so that we can anthropomorphize something that does that is not necessarily anthropomorphized. Okay, let me break the word down. Anthro means human. Morph means form or shape and Ising means the process of making something happen. So the word anthropomorphizing refers to the process of attributing human characteristics, behaviors, or forms to non-human entities. This is what we do to God and to heaven. Does God have a face? He's God. But we say the face of God because it allows us to wrap our mind around it. Are y'all still walking with me? So, when we began to really consider what our existence in heaven will be like, we have to understand that the Bible is anthropomorphizing a spiritual thing so we can wrap our mind around the supernatural. Y'all still walking with me? All right. So here is the question that I start out with from the, from the outset because I covered this last time, but I wanted to circle back one more time and cover it just a little bit more. Will we have bodies in heaven? I will give you two ways of viewing it, because some believe we will, some believe we won't. We will find out when we get there. We'll find out when we get there. So, uh, so first of all, I want to give you a scripture that supports that we will. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2, uh, which just reminds me, Malik, Roy, 
I guess I should have gotten you all of these scriptures, but uh, next go round, maybe, you know. All right, so 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 2. Y'all know all of the scriptures I read in this uh, lean-in Bible study setting will be uh, the New Revised Standard Translation, the NRSV. Um, okay, this is what it says. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for in this tent we groan longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. So here, here's the concept that, well, let me say it this way. Down in South Carolina, you, you ever been down, you ever been to church in South Carolina? No? You, you ever been to church in South, South Carolina? Yeah. Yeah, show of hands, who've been down to church down in South Carolina. So, down in South Carolina, they sing long meter hymns, short meter hymns, that kind of thing. One of the songs that I was introduced down in, in the country is, there's a leak in this old building. And anybody remember the next part? It says, and my soul has got to move. This song is actually rooted in this scripture right here. That if this earthly tabernacle, you know what that is? Our body. That day by day is getting slower, breaking down. Y'all ever wake up in the morning and something hurt? You don't even know why? Y'all ever? You're like, I know you don't. You still young. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you still young. She, she don't know what I'm talking about. You on, you on the cusp. You, on, you, you, got, you, you got to hit your 40s, I think, before you, before you get to there. But, uh. Uh, yeah, look, wake up in the morning and be like, why does, I didn't even, all I did, how you wake up hurt? You ain't done nothing but sleep. You don't know what I'm talking about either. You too young, you have not gotten there. So, a couple of y'all in here, y'all too young. But yeah, man, they just, so, you know what that is? This is a, we have a soul. And this verse describes our soul as being housed by a tent. So this body then being a tent, and according to the Scripture, as this tent deteriorates, if we get to heaven, we get a new tent, which gives, which, gives, uh, which gives leeway for the argument that if our old tent was a body and we get a new tent, then that will be a new body. So that is a, that, that is a, that is a belief that some have. Once again, I'm not here to say what is right, what is wrong. There is scriptural evidence that can support both. I'm not in, I, I'm not into this, I know the right way, because like there is, we will find out. So that's why I'm giving the scripture to support one. Now let me give you the scripture to support the other, that we will not have bodies. I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 and verse 53. Because here's my thing, if I, get a, if I get a body there, is it my body or is it a different body? And if it's my body, is it me at my peak? And what if in life I never had a physical peak? What if I was sick the whole, my whole life? What if, what, if part of, what if part of my body ailments whether I had something missing or, uh, they, you know, so do I get the missing part? So, so uh, those are some questions, but once again, we'll understand that better by and by. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 53. 1 Corinthians 50, 15, verse 52 and 53. Uh, I love the fact when I, when, I see, when I see those hands moving and pages turning and y'all come in Bible study for Bible. All right, uh, th this is what it says. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that's fast, y'all, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And he will, and we will be changed. For this perishable, bo perishable body will put on imperishability. And this mortal body must put on immortality. 
we find out two things about a body in this, in this scripture. Two descriptions of it. It is perishable and it is mortal. So why would a perishable thing go to an imperishable place? And why would a mortal thing go to a place of immortality? And even more to the point, what would be my use for a body in heaven? So there's a lot of questions. I, I, I cannot give you the answer because I don't know. But if the purpose of this body is to house this soul, then when I get to heaven, why would my soul need a house when it's already home? So, but these are the two scriptures. So one thing we do know is that we will have a heavenly existence in heaven. What that heavenly existence looks like, we'll have to wait and find out. We have to wait and find out. All right. Uh, next thing, the presence of God and worship in heaven. I don't understand people that don't like worship but won't go to heaven. It is, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like I don't, <laughs> I don't like water, but I want to go to the pool. I know y'all like, yeah, what's wrong with that? Yeah, yeah you know, I, I love to see these things on social media especially when it's our gatherings. And y'all know what I'm going to say when I say our. I'm talking about us folk. Y'all know what I mean when I say us folk. I'm talking about black folk. <laughs> you ever seen black folk go to a pool party? Nobody get in the pool. <laughs> I saw this. I saw this video. I saw this video of a pool party at A&T. It was packed with people. I mean, it had to be a couple hundred people all crammed all around the pool. Not a single person. <laughs> Not a single person was in the water. So maybe that wasn't the best example, because but you know what I mean. Listen, this is heaven, y'all. <laughs> this is heaven. Well, let me ask you this. If you have to go on a, let's say, a nine-hour road trip, how many people you want to ride with you? You want two people riding, so three people in total in the car. Nine hour road trip. How many people you want, you want to roll with you? You want to? I hear one, five. Is that, is that five? One. I hear two, one. All right. My preference is my preference is I'd rather roll out by, by myself. But doesn't really, but doesn't really come down to this. It all depends on who the company is. It all depends, like, if it's good company, we can roll. If it's bad company, one is too many. It is all about who is keeping you company. When we get to heaven, we get to experience the Shekinah glory of the Lord. That means we are in his very presence. We can see him. In whatever form that is, because remember, these are supernatural things. So I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I know we will be in the Shekinah glory, the presence of the Lord. And in the presence of the Lord, you know what is, what is inspired and required? Worship. Yeah. Revelations 21 and 3. Revelations 21 and 3. Revelations 21 and 3. Some of y'all know how to swim. Still won't get in the water. <laughs> now, ladies, I don't blame you because it could change your hair and, you know, so I, I get it. I get it. Y'all don't fool with the water. Revelation 21 and 3. Revelation 21 and, and 3. Uh, which one of y'all think dislike water the most? Uh, a cat? Or a sister that just got her hair done. <laughs> what y'all? What you? <laughs> hey, 
Both of them scratch if you, if you, you know, trying to get them in the water. Don't. Either way, go. I'm saying you got to tread softly. Okay. Revelation 21 and 3. <laughs> Revelation 21 and 3. Uh, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Heaven, one of the things, one of the most defining things of our existence in heaven is that we will be in the presence of the Lord. And being in the presence of the Lord, make no mistake about it, requires worship. And if you don't want to worship, heaven ain't for you. We have a concept of what heaven will be. We will get our favorite food. Don't say nothing about eating. Unless I have missed it in the scripture somewhere, I don't know nothing in heaven to say we're going to get our favorite meal. And we go, you know why? Because I don't know if we have a body. And if I don't have a body, why would I need food? If I don't have a body, what am I going to put the robe on? <laughs> if I don't have a body, what will the crown sit on? And why would I have a crown when I'm in the presence of the actual king? Are y'all walking with me here? So, all right. So, in the presence of the Lord, worship is required. I don't know what that worship is. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what we're supposed to do. I don't know what we're supposed to say. But I do know the presence of the Lord requires some type of acknowledgement. And how do we acknowledge God? Through worship. Okay. So, that's, so once again, People that don't like to worship, I don't really understand what they think heaven will entail. Uh, I, I think they think it's uh, going to be like uh, going to Hawaii or Cancun or Aruba or, you know what I'm saying, one of these tropical paradise. And I don't, I'm not saying that it won't look like that, but I am saying they're going to be some worship still required. All right. Um, Matter of fact, hey, uh, Malik, uh, Roy, whichever y'all own it, give, give me that, give, give me that, uh, the, uh, the one on Lucy that, that looks like a, a, a tropical paradise for, for a little bit. Um, now, next, our existence in heaven, no more suffering or death. That's what we know the existence in heaven will be. No more suffering or death, Revelation 21 and 4. Revelation 21 and 4, no more suffering or death. How many, uh, I wonder how many pills the average person is on now. Do you know that of the industrialized nations in the world, so of all of the industrialized nations of the world, how many of those allow pharmaceutical companies to advertise directly to the consumer? Of all of the industrialized countries in the world, do you know how many allow pharmaceutical companies to advertise directly to the consumer? You got it right, sir. You're a doctor. I should have known you, you had answer. Two. One is Greenland, if, if memory serves me correctly, and the second one is the United States. Of the advertised dollars per capita, of the advertised dollars per capita, y'all know everything I say, you can Google it. I fact check and verify before I repeat this because we got too many people just spreading misinformation and lies that they didn't verify. Of, of the percentage of advertised dollars, how much of it do you think is in pharmaceutical ads? So, so that's, you know, from 0% to 100%, of the advertising dollars spent in a year are pharmaceutical drug-related ads. That's, that, that's, that's on TV and social media and all of it. What do you say? 
How much? 85, not 90 percent. How much? 80, 60. One last guess. 20 percent. 75 percent. 75 percent. And at the end of all of them, be sure to ask your doctor to put you on our medicine. So by the time, by the time we hit 40, we already on at least one pill. And so on and so forth, because once again, there is a leak in this old building. And as we get older, we're going to have some aches and some ailments. We are going to have some diagnosis and some prognosis. And part of life is physical suffering. Also, part of life is emotional suffering. Holy Ghost, help me in here. Because can't nobody put you through changes like people. So if I'm not suffering because of body, I'm suffering because of relationships, or I'm, you know, so it is just a multitude of things that cause us to suffer here on earth. But when we get to heaven, no more suffering. No more suffering. No more pain. No more suffering. No more pain. Uh, I am free. Praise the Lord. I am free. No more death. The reason there is no more death is because we have already died, and if we made it to heaven, that means we get to live again. So there is an absence of suffering. There is an absence of, of death. Um, so heaven is so heaven and existing in heaven means that all of the suffering that we've been doing is over. Can you imagine that all of the suffering is done. Next, existing in heaven. Existing in heaven. Hold on. Oh, right, right here. Existing in heaven is you will have eternal joy and peace. So no more suffering, no more pain, no more death, and on the reverse side of that, there is eternal joy and peace. Some people are so full of drama. I don't, I don't know if they would know what to do with actual peace. What they going to talk about? Because their whole conversation is negative. What they going to do? Their whole conversation, their, their whole existence is, is based on, on negativity. So if I am absent and devoid of an existence of drama, think about it for a moment. None of us have ever had an existence that is free of drama. There's always something. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around the fact that I'll be in a perfect place that I can't even complain about nothing. Like, you know, this is nice, but uh, it's a little hot, though. <laughs> you know, it is, it, is going to be, it is going to be a shock to the system to be in an actual perfect place in the presence of an actual perfect and almighty God and be in an actual place of joy and peace. Kind of hard to wrap your mind around, isn't it? Like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, so that is, so that there will be, there will be no drama, no can you believe, you know, can you believe that? All like this, right? like all of that, gone, done. No co-worker drama, no family drama, no relationship drama. So you know what that also means? All your favorite TV shows ain't making it to heaven. You know why? It's all drama. And, I, and that's, 
you know, a, the, the way human nature is, there is no story without conflict. We learned that early in school. In order to write a story, it is the, uh, what, the introduction, uh, the introduction of the, uh, of, the, of the protagonist, the introduction of the antagonist, and then there must be, the, uh, there must be some type of meat. Uh, and then after the, the meat or whatever, the event, then there is the conflict. After the conflict comes the things that happen as a result of the conflict and ultimately the resolution. We don't know how to have a story without conflict. It's human nature. If I just said, hey, I went to the store, I got my Reese peanut butter cups, and I came home. You'd be like, what did he tell me that for? Like, what is, where's the story? What you actually mean is, Where's the conflict? What happened? Did you get a good parking spot or did you? You know what I'm saying? That has to be, okay. So, but just wrap, I, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around eternal joy. Not just being happy right now, but eternal joy. Eternal joy, eternal peace. And the next thing that existed in heaven would be like absence of sin and evil which is interesting because, well, and let me, let me give you the scripture for this, Revelation 22 and 3. And I forgot to give you the scripture for the last one. The last one was Psalm 16 and 11. But um, Revelation 22 and 3, it will be the absence of sin and evil. I was, y'all remember, you are, biblical scholars, you are uh, astute in the scriptures. Y'all remember in the book of Job, Satan come to heaven and he coming to and fro, but it says it's the absence of sin and evil. My, my sons and I, we started uh, dur during, during the summer, we've been watching shows uh, after they get done with their video games at night and the girls are asleep because they're not going to watch what my sons want to watch. You know, four-year-old girls are not going to watch what a 10 to 12-year-old boy won't want to watch. So we will, uh, we just started, we just started a, a new show. Uh, it's, it's new to us. It's been out for a while. Uh, and, the, and the protagonist slash antagonist is a, it's a bad guy turned good guy. He's in this kind of heavenly altered alternative universe. Anyway, he has, they, they put this huge stack of papers on the desk in front of him. He's, he's going through like processes. And they put this huge stack of papers in front of him. And he's like, what is this? And they say, that's every word you've ever said. And you got to sign for that. I was like, oh, my. Every word? And can you imagine when the next stack come in and be like, and this is every thought. Hey, Lord, have mercy. Every word, y'all. Every word. So, but this is a place that is absent of sin and evil, which means that even when the devil showed up there, he has no power there. So when we make it to heaven, sin no longer has any power or authority over our life. Uh, let me see if I can explain it a little further here. Revelation 22 and 3. Revelation 22 and 3. It says, nothing accursed will be found. <laughs> Nothing occurs will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. So I told you we're going to be worshiping him over here. But the main thing I want to pull out from this for our understanding about the absence of sin and evil and the absence of his power is that it says nothing accursed will be found there. Who are the cursed? We are the cursed. The curse of Adam and Eve, that when, that when Eve, with her tricky self, and I'm just, 
I don't just, I don't just, I don't just, I don't just, I don't just have fun with y'all. But when Eve and Adam, I'm gonna say I'm gonna call Eve name first since she had since she took a bite first. So because we always say Adam and Eve, but I'm gonna say when Eve and Adam bit the forbidden fruit, and I'm calling it forbidden fruit because the Bible uh, in Old Testament does not explicitly say apple. So uh, when they bit that forbidden fruit, they were cursed. And us being descendants of Adam and Eve have been uh, subject to that curse since our conception. We were born in sin. According to the Bible, we were shaped in iniquity. We don't know an existence outside of the proclivities of sin. You know what that means? That ever since we've been little, ever since we've existed, we have had a lean towards sin. All of us. I'm not talking about you or just me. Everybody on earth that has ever existed is a habitual sinner. We sin out of habit. It is, it is, our, it is our sinful nature. It is, it is the human pull to pull us towards sin, and that is exactly why we need Christ to save us from ourselves. And when we make it to heaven, we have been freed of the curse of the pool of sin. Once again, I can't imagine what that existence feels like. So I got no habitual internal pull towards sin. I have peace. I have joy. Uh, I have peace. I have joy. Uh, there is no more suffering and there is no death. This existence is so far from what we experience it here, it's really hard to wrap your mind around. You mean to tell me I ain't gonna want to cuss even a little bit? <laughs> let, me, let me look over this way. Let me, no, let me look over this way. No, no, let, let me, no, let me, let, let, let me go over this way. You mean to tell me? <laughs> it ain't nobody up there, ain't nobody. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? What would it even be to exist with absolutely no internal pull towards sin? And that is our existence every day of our life. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how saved you are. I, how many scriptures you know, how many hymn songs you know, all of us are pulled towards sin. And to exist without that pull is an existence that is hard to wrap our mind around. I'm glad to see those heads like, yep, it is. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Okay, uh, last one. Last one, and then next, the next week I'll come back and I will finish the existence of, of heaven, and then I, will, then I will get into, because before we leave this study of what, of what heaven looks like, what existence in heaven is. We also got to talk about angels because angels are a part of heaven. And there are angels, there are archangels, there are some angels that were actually um, called by name. Who those angels are, things, things of that nature. We'll, we'll get into it. If it's not in the Bible, I'm not going to teach it. There is, there, there, is some, there is some stuff about, you know, angels. and it ain't, If it's not in the Bible and I can't support it with Scripture, I am not, I'm not interested in it. Okay, all right, last, last thing. Heaven will be our heavenly dwelling place. Christ promised in John 14, 2 and 3. In John 14, 2 and 3. John 14, 2 and 3. How many gospels are there in the Bible? Anybody know how many gospels? There are in, in the Bible, four, y'all, four. Mm -hmm. Y'all, y'all know I will never get you a trick question. You're not gonna be like four. I'm be like wrong. <laughs> Actually, what it is is no nah, four, four gospels. Those gospels in in order that they appear in the Bible are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John, this fourth and last gospel, before we get to the book of Acts, 
the Acts of the Apostles, there is John. Now, just, just a little bonus uh, for you. Um, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the writer of the very next book, which is the book of Acts, is written by Luke. So just, just a little biblical knowledge for you. Okay, all right. Um, this is what it says. We talk about our heavenly dwelling place, prepared by Christ. We already talked about our, our earthly tabernacle and the tent. Now, here's Jesus himself uh, talking about this. It said, in my Father's house are many mansions. In this, in this particular translation of NRSV, it says rooms. If, now, I like mansions better than rooms, y'all. Yeah, so, if we, like, if I'm, if I'm booking my Airbnb or my Verbo, and I got the option of a, a room or a mansion, I'm going to go ahead and choose that mansion. <laughs> so, in my father's house are many rooms or slash mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Imagine, well, the Lord says he prepared it and prepared it specifically for you. So it's a personalized home. I don't know if any of you have ever been uh, have ever been in a situation that you got to build your house, and they let you pick. Do you want what kind of floors do you want? What kind of what kind of uh, what kind of counters do you want? What kind of cabinets do you want? What kind of you know? And you go and you get to personalize your living space. It is. Uh, Jesus goes and prepares it for you, which means you have a home in heaven that is also personalized for you. I don't know what that personalized will entail because I'm not a physical being anymore. And because I'm not a physical being, I'm a supernatural being. I don't need, a, I don't need the things that I need in my physical body. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know. I don't know how many rooms the mansion got in it, because all of these things don't bear themselves out in Scripture. But what I do know is, when you make it to heaven, there is a place for you. There is, and this place is not just for you. It was made for you by a Savior that loves you. And when we were sinners. In our sinking in our own sin, he was still preparing a place for us so that where he goes, we may be also. And and on on next week, I will I'll, I'll talk about something that some other parts of existing. In, in Christ, I mean, existing in, in heaven, that uh, that are important for us to understand, and we'll also delve into the uh, delve into the uh, angels. But everybody, stand to your feet. My brother and sister, I am so honored to once again have the opportunity to open the door of the church. I told you so many times before, it was on a Wednesday that I gave my life to Christ. And if there is somebody that is in this space or somebody that is worshiping with us and I connect the campus, if you have not given your life to Jesus, if you have not accepted him as your, as your Savior, we offer Christ to you today. He loves you. There's nothing you can do about it. If there's anything you even try to do about it, he already knows about it before you even did it. He loves you, brother. He loves you, sister. And he will save you right where you are, just as you are. All you have to do, 
All you have to do is just hear him knocking at the door of your heart. When you hear him knocking at the door of your heart, say, Jesus, here I am. Everything I am, everything I'm not, everything I, I will ever be. Lord, I give.